What I'm going to talk about today is how the hardware that you use gets put together and how you can do it yourself. When you are dealing with circuit boards, a lot of the time you don't really think about how did all those little parts get on there. So this is an 0603 part, I think it is, which is a pretty standard size. It's nowhere near the smallest parts that are used on boards. But that is a resistor which is the same as one of the resistors that's on the ES plant board. So a whole bunch of people were here this morning and um, put together the ES plant project. If you have a look at that circuit board, that is typically the sort of part that you find on it. And it's quite different to the through hole parts that used to be used. And um, they come typically on reels. These are designed for machine assembly. They're not designed for hand assembly. And um, so what happens is that the parts themselves are on a continuous tape which has got a whole lot of little holes in it. And the parts simply sit in the slot. It's got a little advancement guide on the side. So it's like an old style film projector where the sprocket drags it along and you can get parts out of the tape. So what I have here is a whole bunch of tapes sitting in a manual dispenser. So putting boards together by hand, typically what you would do is use a vacuum pickup or a pair of tweezers and lift the little parts off the tape and put them on the board under a microscope. And um, so a roll like this, this is resistors, there are 5,000 on this reel, and I think it cost about $2 US, something like that, for that reel. So the actual cost of the resistors is, you know, fractions of a cent. Um, and when they're on the board, now this is a really embarrassing photo. This, uh, <laughs> this is a photo that I took of, I think, just about the very first surface mount board I ever put together. So these parts were put on by hand. But I actually like using this photo as a demonstration because it's really easy to see the solder paste. So the way this works is that the solder that is used on these boards is not a solid, it's not a wire like you might typically think of solder. It's paste that's very much like toothpaste in consistency. And it's placed on the board um, in, so it's wet, and then the parts simply sit in the paste. Now what you can see there is the, uh, the grey goo which will melt and um, will adhere the parts of the board and form the electrical connection. Uh, but you can see it really easily there. If you actually put that much solder paste on, you get all sorts of bridging problems and tombstones and things. It takes a very tiny amount of solder paste to make a good joint. Now, in the big factories, these parts are put on using a machine like this. So this thing that looks a bit like a flying Terminator has <laughs> little pickups that you can see dropping down from the front. And along the front of the machine, you can see a whole lot of these reels. And this particular machine can support 240 reels simultaneously. And um, the reels themselves come in different widths. These little ones like this are typical for resistors, but you can also get big wide ones for ICs, um, for FETs. They come in a variety of standard widths. So what the machine does is pick up the parts from the reels and put them on the board in the correct location. And you can see how fast this thing is moving. This particular machine, that's not sped up by the way. And for each one of these parts it's putting down, it's doing optical processing of the position of the part and correcting for the alignment on the fly. In a second you'll see it move right here. You see that um, on the left? In that like, quarter of a second, the LEDs flashed a couple of times. Each time it flashed, it was bringing the parts over, illuminating them, a camera was processing the image, correcting for the alignment of the part on the tip, and then it was taking the part over and putting it on the board with sub like hundredth of a millimetre sort of accuracy. So, and these machines can put down 20,000 parts an hour like that. So, if you want to do mass production, that's how it's done, if you've got a million dollars or so for a machine. But, what if you're just doing a few boards? So if you're doing a few boards, assembling by hand is fine. <laughs> But unless you're talking about hundreds of boards, the factories don't want to talk to you with their million dollar machines. And I know from experience that sitting there assembling 50 boards by hand, your back starts to ache and after about a day of looking through the microscope, you, yeah, you need to go and see the chiropractor. So over time I've been looking for, over the last few years I've been looking for some way to solve the problem of how do I build you know, 50 boards without killing myself? And it's that little niche that uh, a desktop pick and place or a homemade pick and place machine can fill. So periodically I go out and I look at the state of do-it-yourself or open source pick and place machines. 
Things like 3D printing have been advancing very rapidly over the last few years. But pick and place is, it's a bit of a more niche application. It hasn't gone through as much development. So each time I've gone out and looked for projects, I've been disappointed. But fairly recently I went out and found some interesting developments. The first one that got my attention was this project called Light Placer. So this is open in the sense that um, the design is published and the source code is published, but it's under a non-commercial license. So um, that's fine for your own use, but it's a little bit limiting. And um, it's very Windows oriented in terms of the software development. This machine was a revelation for me though because there are several very complex parts of a pick and place machine. There is the pickup head itself, which obviously needs to be able to move in a very repeatable fashion to a very high degree of accuracy. But there are also the feeders. If you want to uh, pick up parts from consecutive positions in a feeder, that is a whole complex mechanical assembly itself. It's a very big job designing some kind of a feeder. And when I saw this machine, um, what he'd done is just wrapped out some double-sided tape and stuck the tape down there and uh, you know, put this on it. And I thought, wow, you can actually build a usable pick-and-place machine with no feeder at all. It's just a bit of tape stuck on the board. So I thought, okay, I can probably manage that. That looks achievable. So I started looking around a bit more and I found, oh, that's just a better view of the same machine. Um, and I found a few other projects. There's the Fire Peak Delta, which is a... It's a machine that's trying to be everything. It wants to be a flying probe tester and a laser cutter and print conductive ink and solder paste dispenser and a 3D printer and everything else. So it's designed to have heads that can be removed and then you can put a different head on it for a different purpose. What was interesting about this is that it was using um, some software called OpenPNP, which led me to the OpenPNP project. Now, this finally was what I'd been looking for there is a reference machine design, so the lead developer uh, who is very actively developing this, and there's a very active um, Google group around it with dozens of messages a day and many people involved, has published the designs for his own machine, but the software itself, which is all available under GPL, is abstracted from the hardware. He's put in uh, a driver concept that allows you to use different motion controllers, um, different pickup heads, you, know, you could use a totally different mechanism for the you know, like the Cartesian positioning if you wanted to. So it's very flexible. And um, that really got my attention. So I thought, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to have a go at this. And the other thing that I noticed once I started looking at this is that this looks remarkably like a 3D printer. And I've done a bit of messing around with 3D printers. So how many people here have built or used or used, you know, have a 3D printer? Yeah, there's a whole lot of people. Okay, so that is a remarkably common project to do now. And if you have the skills to build or maintain a 3D printer, you have the skills to do the same for a pick and place machine. So another really interesting example, this is someone that's taken a little bit further. It's um, a machine that has a bunch of holders on the side for reels, and then he can advance the tape and pick it up from consecutive positions on the tape instead of having the tape just stuck to the board. So, and it's got a little display and all sorts of funky things in there. So that's just a more advanced version of the same sort of thing. But it, what this showed is that I could start with something that was really achievable. It's just the similar XY chassis to a 3D printer and then a few other things bolted onto it. And then I could iterate on that and, um, and improve it over time. But it meant I could have something that was usable and useful in a very short increment. I didn't have to bite off a huge project before I got a benefit from it. So I looked around for chassis uh, options. Of course, you can build your own. I wanted to save a bit of time. So I looked at things like the Shapeoko and the X-Carve chassis. And I found a place called 3D Tech, who I think are in Brisbane, um, that do CNC machines. And they do a kit called the XYZ Carve, which is basically a locally sourced version of the X-Carve. So I bought a se the 700 mil size kit of the XYZ Carve as a mechanical chassis only. So this is intended to be a CNC machine, uh, but I bought it without the, uh, the spindle and the various other bits. And that was $650 including shipping for the complete chassis to get me the X, Y and part of the Z axis hardware. 
and there's you know a few hours of assembly and um, tweaking tensions on belts and things and you've got a chassis that can do most of the job. So I then added the, um, the Tiny G motion controller which has four output channels for driving steppers and I mounted that on the uh, the carriage itself. Originally I was going to build an external control box and then run all the cabling onto the machine and I thought hey it'd be so much neater and you wouldn't have anything hanging off it and you know there'd be nothing loose if you just put the controller on the machine. Didn't quite work out that way but um, so the motion controller itself is on the machine and um, I just used the laser cut bracket to attach that. So I then had to figure out how to do the actual pickup head. So I knew that I would need some kind of vertical slide rails and uh, made a laser cut base. Now one of the mechanisms that I had seen done for this is using a horizontally mounted um, stepper motor with a cam on it to drive a pickup head up and down. And, and another mechanism that I've seen is a stepper motor with a, um, a large wheel on it and a, a a piece of tooth belt um, which is screwed onto it so it, as it rotates it just raises the belt up and down and I thought yeah that looks like a, an interesting model but being cheap and um, wanting to do it in a more simple way I thought I'll just stick like a hobby servo on there and use that to lift it up and down so I've got a couple of the little um, mini slide rails that you can see there if we just get in a bit closer what you can see are hobby servos that are mounted above the slide rail and the concept is to use gravity to allow the head to be lowered when required and the servo would simply pull on it to lift it up to get clearance. So on the head itself you need to not just pick up parts and move them around but you also need to rotate them because they could be at any arbitrary angle relative to the position they are in the feeder. So it's common to have to rotate a part 90 degrees, um, many parts are polarised so you've got to rotate them to align them correctly and um, this is um, a couple of hollow shaft stepper motors. So it's a stepper motor and you can probably just see there there's the white in the centre of the hole. That's looking straight through the centre of the stepper motor. And these are designed specifically for do-it-yourself pick-and-place machines. There's a company that makes them just for that purpose. And uh, they are NEMA 11 steppers, I think it is. So what I did was mount a stepper which is inside the um, like underneath that big bracket. What you see there is the slide, the chassis for the little slide rail, a bracket, um, there is a rotation coupling. So what I did was have a bit of hose that goes onto the shaft of the stepper motor and then on the other end of the shaft of the stepper motor is the pickup head. So this, in this photo it's a Samsung pickup head, it's from a commercial pick and place machine. You can go out and buy spares for commercial pick and place machines which um, solves a lot of the problems that you have when you're building your own. So you can incorporate commercial parts into your own machines. And what this allows is for a vacuum feed to come in from the left. Obviously this would normally be mounted vertically when it's fitted. So the vacuum feed comes into the rotation coupling on the left and then it passes all the way through the hollow shaft stepper down to the tip. So the tip uh, comes down to a very fine point but it's like a syringe. It's got a tiny little hole in it. And by applying vacuum to that it allows us to pick up parts. And here's just another view of the same thing, but mounted on the, uh, on the machine. So this is the point I got up to. It has the pickup head mounted on it. And you can see a couple of vacuum solenoids at the top. There is some fish tank tubing, which provides the vacuum. And there is a fish tank pump, which sits off to the side. It's just running backwards, basically. You can take an, a regular fish tank pump uh, open it up, turn a diaphragm around, put it back together and instead of blowing it sucks. So that's a very simple way to do it. So it just gives the low level of vacuum that can be used for picking up parts. And um, oh. is it going to play? Yeah, so what you can see here is not moving a part around, it's simply lowering down. It's picked up a part that you can just see on the tip and then I'm going to lower it down and it releases the vacuum and you'll see that it leaves the part in place. So this was the very first test. It was simply checking whether it could pick a part up out of the tape and then put it back down again by controlling the solenoids. The head itself is reasonably self-contained. There is an Arduino sitting on top of it with some FETs that control the vacuum solenoids and it controls the servo as well. 
Uh, yeah, and it's got a, like a very simple serial protocol on it, so you can send commands to the head and it will take care of things by itself. And this is a snippet of the machine putting parts down on the ES plant board. There is a full assembly sequence, I think, that John posted on YouTube, which shows the, uh, the placement of all the parts on the board from beginning to end, but that takes a few minutes. I think it was about three and a half minutes or so for a board. That wasn't all of the parts. Um, we left off some of the parts that were put on by hand afterwards, but it took care of the majority of the passives and, and things that it would be really laborious to just sit there and do yourself by hand. So what the result has been is a machine that basically gets me out of that pit of despair and lets me deal with small numbers of boards that don't justify going to um, an overseas assembly house. So the detail, most of the detail on this doesn't matter, but last night I just did a quick add up of, okay, what's this cost me so far? If it came to $1,250, you could reproduce everything that I've done. And um, with, there's one little thing in there that will probably make you go, what, if you notice it? It's this thing right here. Why the hell would you pay $70 for a hobby servo? It's because after the first day or two of using the machine, um, the servo itself started getting really sluggish and um, then it made a nasty burning smell. <laughs> and, uh, so I thought, oh, that one was bad and I took it out and put another one in and um, a day or so later the same thing happened after another day or so of use. So I went down to the hobby shop and I said, give me the, like, the biggest, most expensive servo you've got. And they said, you need this one, it's red, it's awesome. <laughs> so it really is a good servo, but it's like a top of the range hobby servo. One of the advantages of using this particular thing is that it doesn't have any seek uh, if you power it off and then power it back up again. It just holds its position rock solid. But uh, that was an unexpected nasty thing. So just before I get to a quick demo, because I'm almost out of time, once the board comes off here, it needs to be heated up so that the solder will melt and all the parts will adhere. And this is my super high-tech solution. <laughs> I went down to the good guys and said, give me your cheapest toaster oven. And um, what you can see down here in the corner, there is an Arduino with a little display on it. It's got a thermocouple interface and it's got um, a couple of FETs for outputs which drive the power board behind it. And what this does is allow the, uh, basically I can press a button and the oven will follow the proper reflow profile. So it brings it up to a certain temperature and holds it for a while, then increases it at the correct rate and then brings it down to cool it. Speaking of cooling, the other thing I added into this, just because I seem to like servos, is once it gets to the point where it needs to cool, it fires a servo and it pulls the door open. <laughs> so I get some ventilation. <laughs> yes, I'm lazy. Did that one cost 70 bucks? <laughs> no, that one did not cost 70 bucks. <laughs> it's doing um, less work. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, now the difficulty with doing a demo is that it's going to be very hard for a lot of you to see what's going on down here. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll show you just quickly the, um, the software that drives this. So this is OpenPNP. It's connected to the machine right now. And um, it allows me to drive it around manually so I can, you know, move it forward and you can see the camera view. So there is a little endoscopic camera that's attached to the front and it's got crosshairs on there and you can see that uh, it's tracking the position. So if I want to do something like go to um, the position of a part on the board, I can drive the camera to that particular location and you can, uh, it understands, the software has a concept of um, heads, tips, cameras, nozzles, all of these things are, are different and hierarchical, and it also has offsets between them. So I could, say, drive this particular nozzle. The camera view is going to drift off, but right now the nozzle will be exactly over the position the camera just was a second ago. So what you can do is, um, in a very simplistic form, if you want to set up a board, what I could do is say, OK, I want a new placement, and I'll call this one R3 and um, I'll drive the camera a little bit to the right, so I want it to be approximately there. The, um, the camera quality on this is, is very poor because I'm cheap, so I've got a cheap camera. Um, but you can still see that, you can see the position of the two pads there, and by driving the machine around, you can align it and say, okay, that is where I want you to put the part, 
And now I want to capture that location. So um, set the placement to the current camera position. So we'll capture that. It's set the XY coordinates. I could set rotation here if I wanted to. And now I can say what part it is that I want to place. So I can say it's 1K0603 and you can skip it or you can place it or whatever. So you can set up jobs manually if you have a small number of parts. You can also import jobs from um, Eagle and KiCad, which is what we did for the ES plant board. So you just export a file from, uh, from KiCad, which lists all the placements. It says, I've got a 1K resistor, it's at this coordinate and this orientation. You can do a bulk import and you end up with a big list of parts and then you might need to do a bit of tweaking, but it saves you a whole lot of work. So you can also define feeders. Um, I could be hours going through all the features of OpenPMP, but this will just give you a general idea. So in this particular case, I've got a feeder set up for 1K resistors, which is what I was just defining. And oh, because the resolution has changed, I can't see much on here. But what I can do is drive the camera to the position of the feeder. And we can see that that's the location of the resistor it wants to pick up. And this particular feeder, um, this is one of the nice things about OpenPNP as well, is it doesn't require the feeder to move. This is one of the things that allows us to work with just pieces of cut tape lying on the board. We can define the offsets. <coughs> really doesn't like working at this low resolution. Can't see anything much at all. That's, that's better. So what I've got is a piece of tape with four millimeter offsets in the x-axis. Um, there are 20 positions and we've fed one already. So it keeps track of how many it's dispensed from the tape so that it increments to the next location each time. Um, there is also support for uh, um, camera assistance, so vision assistance. It can do things like look at the part before it moves the tip to pick it up and uh, account for orientation of the part within the tape. Because the, the parts themselves can move by fractions of a millimeter, they can be a little bit rotated off center. Uh, but what we can do now, if we go back to this job, is I should be able to hit play and, um, and have it run through and try to pick up some parts. At the moment I've got vacuum turned off and it's not actually going to pick them up, but later when you have a chance to come around I can run it and actually pick parts up. So let's see if we get the big demo fail. So what it's doing now is moving to each consecutive position, lowering the head, um, changing the status of the vacuum solenoids to pick it up and then going back to pick up the next position, the next part once it's placed it down. So it would have just run through the sequence and of placing those three parts. So what you just saw was a very short demonstration of what, um, you know, the same thing you do if you want to put down 20 or 30 or 50 parts. So a few minutes set up and we can place three parts. Obviously you can do that by hand very easily, but if you've got to do 30 boards, it's a lot easier to do that couple of minutes set up put the board in place, press play, and it does it for you. It also does things like correction for the position of the PCB. Um, it can do uh, what's called fiducial correction. So you can have known features on the board and it will use the camera to look for those features and then correct the position of the PCB and apply that offset to all of the parts that it places. So what I can do is take a PCB, put it down in the bottom left corner of the work area and not actually care about getting it perfectly aligned. I just hit play. It goes, it goes there, finds the PCB, fixes the correction, the, the alignment, puts all the parts on, gets to the end and says, hey, I'm done. So from a couple of years ago when I went looking for open source PNP machines and couldn't really find anything to the possibility of what you can do today, there has been a lot of advancement. It really is like the state of 3D printing where it's changed so rapidly in such a short time and you can do very cool things now. So if you have the skill to build a 3D printer and you have the need for a pick and place machine, this is within your reach. You can build this if you want to.